Stop, it sounded like you had a, a wonderful musical education growing up, but, but then there was a lot of music in your house. Can you put into words the effect that the music your father introduced you to had on you as a, as a young boy? I, you know, I don't really think I can. Um, it was, it's, it's such a kind of a gut thing, you know? Um, the music that I listened to when I was growing up always kind of caught me in a place that no other music ever, ever caught me in. Yeah. You know, it was a real real kind of gut response I'm gonna go upstairs um and, and you know when I I listen to other kinds of music during my life but nothing in my life ever ever grabbed me like that that old stuff and it's still the same way I I listen to the, that old stuff and preference to everything else and it still it still grabs me right in the heart where it always did do, do you think you still would have been drawn to it anyway with, without your father's influence you know I, I I like to think I would have, but I don't think, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure it would have been the same. Um, because now, you know, the music is both important because it's music and it's also important because it was something my father loved. And, you know, I don't have him. And so the music has taken on, uh, you know, something that's so much more important than just music now. I um, have an 11 year old daughter learning guitar at the moment and I showed her some footage of, of you playing and, and she could not believe that you were pretty much a self-taught player <laughs> do you think you would have gone down the same if you had you gone down the traditional path of guitar lessons you'd still be at the same place now musically I, you know I like to think I'd be way beyond where I'm at now <laughs> <laughs> you know it took me so long and it was such a struggle you know you listen to something and you try to play it and you know I I, I was reading that there was an interview, there's a series of interviews about Dave Ray, who is one of my favorite guitar players, he was from the Twin Cities, and, and uh, you know, people talking about how he was self-taught, and everything kind of went through what they called the Dave Ray filter, and uh, as I feel that way about the way I play, you know, I, you know, I can learn stuff, and I can get real close, I can kind of get an a approximation of what I'm trying to play, but... It, it goes through the you know the Charlie Parr filter because it, it'll mm. come out sounding like me no matter what I do with it. <laughs> and I think if I had taken lessons and gone about it the right way, I could have actually played the songs that I love, you know, a little more faithfully. <laughs> in, in a way, that's not necessarily a good thing because I, you know, I don't feel like I, you know, I don't feel like I really need to reproduce songs that were made in the twenties. I can listen to records of them and. Playing in my own way, you know, it, it actually is make it makes it more important to me. I guess I, that that idea of being sentimental about music kind of comes back into play there. Now, musically, your songs are, are seeped in tradition, but they can be quite contemporary uh, lyric-wise. Do, do you think that might be a, a key to the fact that you are attracting audiences from a wide age spread of people? Um, maybe. I, I'm not really sure why the people are interested in it that much. I, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a, you know, I'm, I'm, this kind of music has never been either overly popular or very unpopular. It's always kind of rode in that weird kind of place where <laughs> there's always some people that like it and there's always a great majority of people that just don't see any, any anything in it. I, I, you know, I, I don't really know. I, I mean, there's a lot of shows where I've got a pretty good cross section and, and uh but but people always tell me they can't understand anything i'm saying anyway so i'm not sure <laughs> <if> the lyrics <laughs> People do have a hard time uh, finding a category for, for what you do. Have there been any examples of uh, labels people have placed on your music that it, have uh, been completely baffling to you? Um, oh, a whole bunch of them. <laughs> <laughs> I, got, I get called bluegrass, which I don't play any bluegrass. I get called blues a lot, and I don't play very many blues songs. I play a guitar that's associated with blues music. I play a national steel body guitar, but I don't play very much blues. Um, I get called country every once in a while. They don't play any country music. I, you know, the, th the problem with those categories, though, is that they were they were made up by record companies and radio stations in the in the 30s and 40s. You know, they really don't have a lot to do with the actual music. Before before those categories came along, it was just music, and you know, most most music out there was folk music, meaning that folks played it. You know, just anybody played music, and you know, you couldn't afford to buy records, so you could make your own music, and that's that's you know that's. I guess the, 
what I feel like um, I'm I'm closest to it is that kind of uh, um, you know do it yourself kind of aspect because I'm certainly no no professional by any means. Um, yeah, uh, I do get the impression that. Um, your motivation for playing music is not a commercial one. It's purely the sheer enjoyment of playing. Would that be a fair comment? Oh, yeah. It's always been that way. I, I've, I've played guitar obsessively ever since I could figure out how to tune one. And uh, it, it's, I do it no matter what. You know, it, it's been a, hap- a series of either happy or maybe not happy accidents that's got me to, you know, being able to play as much as I play, you know, in front of people. But... I'd play as much as I'd probably play more if I wasn't playing music. If I had a job, I'd probably play guitar just as much or more because I can't stand not to, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Yours is a style that uh, thrives on on being presented in, in a live uh, situation. Do you um, take any specific steps when recording in a studio situation to maintain that live feel? Yeah, I stay out of studios altogether. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't like studios. They make me really uncomfortable. I, I feel like they, they uh, stifle what little bit of liveliness I had left in me. Yeah. Uh, you, uh, you have recorded in some unlikely locations, haven't you? I've, 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 well, there's a buddy of mine who lives down the road here in Duluth, and I've recorded in his garage. He's got a you know double garage um, that's a pretty good spot for recording in. Um, I have basements and you know, storefronts and bar basements and... You know, living rooms and places like that always seem to be the most comfortable place to record for me. You're very much living the life of the independent musician. What are some of the major obstacles that you've uh, had to overcome in in your day-to-day conducting of your career? Um, Surprisingly few, actually. I I just, I love doing this. I love playing music and I like, I don't mind driving and I, I don't mind... You know, the, 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 I guess the problems that that I have with the whole situation are that are when I'm not doing any of that stuff. You know, the, the sitting in front of the computer gives me a headache, so I don't like I don't like um, you know that kind of businessy part of it very much. Because mm. I, you know, I'm a high school dropout. I'm not real. I don't. I've ne- you know, and I was come up during a time when computers weren't really around. You know, we never saw them much, and they give me a headache now. So I don't like dealing with that very much. Um, but I, I like everything else. I, I, I haven't really encountered any real major obstacles. I mean, I've done well enough to keep myself on the road. And, um, you know, my, my, my wife has been very supportive about the whole thing and, and, you know, my children too. And in the summertime when we're all together, we go on the road together. And, and uh, they're even going to come to Australia for a little bit to, to be with me. So oh, I feel like I've been pretty lucky in, in you know, not having a real rough time at it. Now, I read where you um, you write a lot of your songs on, on banjo. Do you um, ever write with the intent of recording it that way, or are you always still conscious that the song will probably end up on guitar? Yeah, I've, rec- I've recorded a couple things on banjo, um, and I probably will do more. I'm bringing my banjo on the tours nowadays. Um, it's because I like playing it a lot. <clears throat> um, but the, most stuff ends up on guitar just because that's, it's a little easier to deal with on the road. Um, and bottleneck and banjo in my world anyway are pretty 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 closely related so it's easy to jump back and forth between one and the other i play you know i play a fretless banjo and um, bottleneck style guitar so you know you you, you don't have you, you got a lot of, a lot of the same tunings at least in in, in like i said in my world where where the rules are kind of fuzzy <laughs> One thing I like about your records, they have a real raw quality to them. They're not polished up with, with slick production values. They maintain a, a real honesty. Is that a particular feel that uh, that you do always set out to achieve? I do set out to achieve that, yeah. I think I'd, I think I'd have to do that anyway because, you know, it's expensive to get those production values up that high. Um, but, but I like, in my personal life, when I listen to recordings, I like recordings that are that are a little more honest sounding. I, like, I listen to a lot of field recordings. Um, and uh, and so um, you know when I when I when I when I when I think about what I want to hear for myself, I think about those records, and and that's what I strive for. And, and you know, I, people sometimes they don't like the lo-fi stuff, but but I think it's uh, I think it's important for the kind of music that I make. And I would be 
I don't want to. I don't want to be uh, at a show and sell somebody a CD that's got a lot of high production values on it because that's obviously not what they're going to hear at the shows, mm-hmm. and it never will be. So I, I, I'm just not going to do that. Also, where uh, Greg Brown has compared you to the late Dave Van Ronk, is that a comparison that sits well with you? Well, it's extremely flattering. Dave Van Ronk is one of my favorite guitar players, and I never got to meet him. I got close, and then he passed away, and I got a good friend of mine, Dakota Dave Hall, is one of his best friends before he died. And, and it's, it's an extremely flattering comment that Greg made. I don't think I live up to it even uh, a little bit. Um, it, it's just a very nice thing for him to say, but you know, it made me feel real warm inside when he said it. But I sure don't. I don't. I would never. I'd never say that to anybody myself. I don't. I, I don't get that far as far as Dave Van Ronk got. One thing you can certainly lay claim to is pointing people in the direction of the musical pioneers that inspired you. Have you noticed in your travels an increasing knowledge in, in younger people of, of where this music stems from? Oh, I think so. I mean, you know, I think a lot of people that play this kind of music realize that we stand on the shoulders of a lot of, a lot of people and the folk tradition is, is built on the shoulders of everybody like that you know you just you know you live with that and and you live in in the pride of that you know that you're you know that you're you know you're you're endeavoring to be part of a, of, of a big of a big deal and so you want to point people in those directions and people that listen to this kind of music they want to find those directions because I think people that listen to this kind of music they understand that I'm not making up anything that you know this is this is uh, part of a part of a, a pretty pretty wide river um, and I have seen a lot of people that you know you go to shows and you play stuff and they say hey man that you know that's Charlie Patton and you say of course that's Charlie Patton and and you play something that you made up, and and they and they like that too, and maybe can, you know, can appreciate the fact that you're adding to the to the river a little bit. Now you're based in Minnesota, which is uh, the area where Bob Dylan hailed from, and he's uh, come under a bit of notoriety lately for having his music used in advertising campaigns, and something you've you've had a bit of success in down here in Australia. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what what feedback have you had from that? Um, mixed feedback. I, you know, it's, I don't know. I, I, I didn't. I didn't really. I, as far as the Dylan, I didn't really know much about what he had done, and I, um, I think it was for an underwear commercial. Yeah, which is pretty good stuff, I guess. <laughs> um, I don't know. I'm, I've got you know, I've gotten mixed reactions from it. And a lot of people are you know saying, well, you know, good for you, and everybody knows that it's hard to make a living doing this, and. You know, I I've, I kind of came at it from the idea that well, I don't want to change anything that I do, and if I don't have to change anything that I do, or wear a T-shirt, or you know, um, use a, use a cell phone, I guess I guess it's not a big deal to me as long as it doesn't you know compromise what the music is about in the first place. Um, it's it's a touchy one. I'm not really 100% sure that I'm I'm satisfied about it, and um, most people have had you know they're okay with it. Yeah. Um, and you know the the other the other thing about me that I've kind of you know either for good or bad what I've done so far is really not paid much attention to what anybody says about it because like I said I'm not a professional musician by any means I'm just a guitar player but um, so I haven't paid a whole lot of attention to what people say about it I did it you know it may be right it might be wrong but you know it's probably not something. That, I want to think about too much, I guess. <laughs> well, it certainly sparked some attention to you down here and raised your profile, so that can't be a bad thing. Yeah, I guess I guess you're right there. <laughs> now, you do also, apart from your own shows, Dan, here you're doing some shows with Paul Kelly. Uh, are you familiar with Paul's work? I am. I am. I'm very excited about that. I, I'm, I'm happy to have the opportunity to get to listen to him play every night for a while. It's going to be <laughs> really nice. And what areas uh, outside of the U.S. Uh, are good for you? I haven't been too much outside the U.S. I've been I I work in Ireland a lot. I, I've always done real well there, and I've I've done real well in England and Scotland. And past that, I haven't gotten I haven't gotten anywhere else. I've gotten some offers to go and visit Europe, and and uh, I might do that um, this this fall. Um, and other than the uh, coming up trip to Australia, I haven't I haven't been out the country. And just before I let you go, Charlie, what else is uh, in your plans for uh, 2009 after you leave us? Well, I've got a um, a couple of recordings. I'm going to make a, a live recording that's going to be released on vinyl here in, in Minnesota, and another 
working a little bit more with this Irish record company called Independent out of Dublin, and I'm going to try to do a um, instrumental, twelve-string instrumental record with some members of Pelt on a, on a record label called Clang. Uh, and then you know the usual. I've got tours st- scheduled right up into the end of uh, the year, uh, going out to the west and, and southwest and visiting Texas. Uh, coming back over to um, do uh, some shows in England and Ireland and maybe Belgium and the Netherlands and then um, uh, you know New York and the South and weekly shows in Duluth and just playing guitar as much as I can and take care of the kids. I guess. Fantastic. Busy times ahead. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Charlie, thanks so much for uh, taking the time to catch up with us today. Really looking forward to, you, to your visit down here. The, the, it's, it's a lot of people quite excited about uh, the prospect of seeing you live. Appreciate that. And uh, have a safe flight over, and we'll, we'll see you in April and May. That sounds great, John. Thanks, thanks for calling. I appreciate it. No problem at all. All the best. All right. You too. Bye-bye. Bye.